There are tons of stories to be told. It's how do you extract those stories and repeat it again next week. We are part of this journey and what we do from now on matters. Welcome to the second renaissance where we decode the rebirth of human creativity in a technology-driven world. In this second season, we explore how sustainability is elevating our human consciousness and catalyzing us to create within constraints. We decipher why now is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity since the dawn of industrialization and what leaders can do to harness these winds of change. I'm Anders Sulman Nilsson, global futurist, impact champion and father and your host for The Second Renaissance. Today on The Second Renaissance, I sit down in the Think Studio with Mike Hanley. We talk about sustainable content strategies, equitable business, what he learned at the World Economic Forum, and how to create memorable memes that change both hearts and minds. Mike Hanley founded the Content Engine in 2019 to work with ambitious organizations to amplify and scale the impact of their communications through quality content. As head of digital communications at the World Economic Forum for eight years, he built a team that turned the forum into the largest owned media publisher in the world. A graduate of the London School of Economics and the London Business School, he's been working to produce the world's best content with some of the world's top organizations for 25 years. Mike is an old mate and client of mine, and it was great to have him in the studio while he was on a hiatus in Sydney, away from his current home in Geneva, Switzerland, and to co-create some digital nutrition for our listeners and our viewers around the world. The vision at the Content Engine is to become the world's most advanced content agency, combining technology and art for effective communications. Welcome to the second renaissance, Mike. Great to have you in the studio in Avalon Beach, all the way from Geneva. All the way from Geneva, although today it was just from Bondi, which is far enough, yeah. frankly. Little little pit stop, but mm. uh, great to have you uh, have you back in Australia uh, on, on the ground, the way things are changed yeah, because of the great, pandemic. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's, um, it's definitely a different pace of life in Australia post-pandemic. Um, in fact, it's a different pace of life everywhere post pandemic but uh, it's a different pace of life over here than it is in Europe mm. and it's been nice to it's been nice to sample that it so we're sitting here creating content and I hate the idea of or the expression of creating content mm. um, but we're living in this world where of course content is at the forefront of everyone's minds I heard a great statement um, uh, that you might have come across because we're going to talk about content and sustainable content and digital content and digital nutrition and all the rest content 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 you of course run a company called the content engine mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not dissing content but I heard that content is chemistry wrapped in narrative in other words I love that yeah That's isn't it cool. wonderful I mean, we know about the hero's journey and, and, and the importance of digital nutrition and how story can, can change things. But it makes me think about not just our story, but the fact that when creators create content, it comes with responsibility. And it comes with a responsibility because every piece of content in a digital world, which can be quite addictive, comes with this sort of ethical responsibility or when we create something, it can have the ability to trigger brain chemistry in the recipient or whoever actually consumes that content. It's an interesting idea because actually, okay, the, the kind of content that you're referring to is, uh, you know, blogs, videos, uh, Instagram posts, th that kind of content is one thing. And if you're... Um, if you're a leader of an organisation uh, or somebody who, in fact, a leader of a team or even a team member who needs to get into the hearts and minds of their colleagues, you need to tell a story and you need to be able to add a little bit of chemistry, right? So even that, when you're going to the team meeting and you're talking about what it is we're going to do next week or how, you know, sorry guys, gonna, you know, I'm going to have to work hard because X, Y, Z, you're telling a story and you're getting into the analog hearts and the digital minds of, of, of your colleagues, mm. right? So it's all, about, it's all about how do you add that chemistry and it's a bit of a tangent, but one of my favourite 
distinctions lately has been what's the difference between a narrative and a story? Do you know what? Do you know what the difference between a narrative and a story is? No, but I would love to be love enlightened. To find out. Yes, a narrative is uh, leaves the uh, the ending open, whereas a story is the but the hero has his journey and he, and then he gets the prize at the end. Whereas a narrative is we are part of this journey and what we do from now on matters, and that's the difference between narrative and a story. Yeah, so you can use that. Yeah, anytime. fantastic. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's yeah. it's. Uh, it's going to be an important thing in my futurist toolkit yeah. in, in the near future and, yeah. and far horizon futures as well. Yeah. So um, our story it sounds very, very, our very, very romantic, our, our, our narrative, because it hasn't ended yet, right? There's what do we do from here? A, it's great, as I said before, to have you back on the ground in, in Australia. You're doing some great, amazing things since you left the World Economic Forum as the uh, head of digital, uh, as someone who really, I think, one, the digital minds and the analog hearts of what's going on at the World Economic Forum at Davos. You're back from Switzerland in Bondi today at Avalon Beach. But we go back. Our story kind of begins in 2009. I know you were working for the Australian Financial Review at the time. You gave my first book, two out of three stars. I still hold you uh, sorry, to account sorry for, for that. that. Missing star. <laughs> sorry missing, for the missing star. The missing star. And then um, we did some really great, again, content narrative work, future narrative work when you were working as part of UTS sort of revival and renaissance. Yeah, so I was uh, so I was working with an amazingly creative woman called Jet Swain. Hello, who, Jet. Hello, Jet. Uh, who um, who hired me to build a team to build a brand? We. You know, we we invented this brand called Business Twenty One C. It was you know early earlier in the twenty first century when things were still the twenty first century was still we're, fresh, we're still yeah. optimistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we still thought the twenty first century was going to be a good thing. And uh, Business Twenty One C was all about about uh, design thinking, about understanding where we were going to go in a conscious and mindful way, and helping businesses be innovative and creative around that by telling, uh, by interpreting the analytical and academic work that the great academics at UTS were coming up with in ways that were very easy to understand. So we did a lot of great work around videos with, you know, with video storytelling. It was the early days of social media. It was the early, you know, Facebook was a good thing. It was an optimistic thing where we could meet with our friends. It wasn't changing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't bringing down democracy yes. as we know it. Uh, but we did a lot of uh, hugely creative things uh, with this concept of uh, a new way of doing business, designing, designing a better future. Um, UTS Business School was just launching at the time it had uh, commissioned it commissioned Frank Gehry to build a new business to build a new um, building in Ultimo and uh, it was uh, fantastically optimistic and fantastic time and I believe you did the opening uh, keynote address at the at the launch party for business 21c and I remember you charging on stage and uh, in a with a, in a burst of energy. Yeah, I think Jet introduced uh, me and my um, Baltic friend uh, Nils Vesk as a as a Scandinavian dance troupe or troupe uh, in front of uh, <laughs> some very very senior business people. And you just reminded me that I fell over a beanbag or something like that as you charged on stage. <laughs> I remember you. I had totally tripping forgot over that. a beanbag, but yeah. your your energy yeah. carried it all. It was at the Opera House actually? It was there great. you go. I still do my own stunts, but um, and the story kind of continued from there. I think we became you know pretty pretty good friends, and and we've had the opportunity to connect in in Geneva at the World Economic Forum. I actually believe that even f further back in time, uh, just after we'd done work at the Sydney Opera House together and with B21C, uh, we actually sat down in the very early days of podcasting in, in like 2009, 2010, yeah, thereabouts. That's right. And recorded at the University of Technology, that's Sydney, right. pre-Spotify and all the rest. Um, yeah, we had, a, we, had a, we had a regular weekly uh, a podcast that where we invited notable people notable thinkers such as yourself uh, and we had a weekly newsletter and it was really uh, a fantastic model for the kind of thing that every organization uh, does these days or has to do in order to communicate with with their customers and with their partners and their stakeholders and 
what I do today and what my team does today at the content engine is a direct line from there. So what I did at Business 21C, I then went on to do in spades at the World Economic Forum. So today the World Economic Forum has, I don't know, six, seven, eight million uh, visitors a month to its website. It has the little square, little videos telling telling stories in socially, digital, uh, digitally appropriate viral ways. Those little videos get a billion views a year uh, across Facebook and the other platforms and learn an enormous amount about how to create content in a, uh, you know, create high quality content in a factory kind of an environment where mm. you've got quality control, where you've got, where you're moving things through the, through the through the through the conveyor belt and getting things out, making sure that the system doesn't confound you in the process of getting to publish your content, and then understanding who's reading what, what's performing well, how different pieces resonate with the audience, and doing more of that and less of what doesn't work, and reading the analytics and going mm. back and doing that. Sounds like a there. sort of a Netflix, but for business thinkers and. You know, yeah, da- data-based to, approach to you know client in, centricity and, and and educating the world and of course I guess the stakeholders and and the decision makers then end up at Davos. So the idea is the idea with the world. So the World Economic Forum is a large organisation. It's got a thousand corporate members. Each member pays you know varying amounts of money to be a member, and that uh, those membership fees allow you uh, certain rights, access rights. To, to go to Davos, but in and around that, there there are literally tens of initiatives around improving the state of the world. You know, creating uh, you name it. There are you know de- tens of tens of initiatives that the members get involved with, and so there is an you know like many large organisations, there are a ton of stories to be told. Uh, across this, you know, across everything that's happening in this organisation, and also in the world, uh, around issues and themes that impact what's happening inside the organisation, and that's true for the forum. It's also true for you know any any whatever whatever company or organisation or not for profit or whatever you work for has a ton of stories to be told. So the question is not do we have content because of course you do. Yes. Everybody comes to work every day and everybody is contributing and they're contributing because of the narratives that we tell ourselves when we go to work. So there are tons of stories to be told. It's how do you extract those stories into actual ideas for pieces of content and then how do you turn those ideas into actual pieces of content Mm blog posts, videos, Instagram posts, TikToks, whatever it is, how do you tell the stories that you have to tell in a ways that are appropriate and repeat it again next week? Yeah. So yeah. so that so that that's the kind of through line from Business 21C around all of those stories that we were telling around design thinking and business the world economic forum and all of the all of the all of the dozens hundreds thousands of stories that we told there and now what we're doing at the content engine with our customers and how we help our customers tell their stories repeatedly in high quality and high impact ways. And there is a certain sense of sort of memetics around this or ID viruses or as you call it the sort of content factory uh, and ownership of certain you know styles of intellectual property that come with all of this. I mean, I'm just thinking of one example here, which is the terminology around the fourth industrial revolution, for example, which I believe you and and some of your colleagues and and the CEO at the World Economic Forum sort of came up with. But I think that was uh, a concept and this sort of intersection of biology, uh, the physical and the digital, if I'm not uh, mistaken, that has shaped a lot of organizations thinking about the world we're currently in, this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. But um, tell me if I'm wrong, but is that an example of like a piece of content that you can then drive a lot of awareness from, not just in terms of who your stakeholders are, but also kind of elevating, you know, the world's consciousness about the trends that are that are shaping the next 100 or 200 years? Well, it's a great example of how content can drive awareness. So 
if you know, if you're curious, go to Google Trends and uh, type in the fourth industrial revolution and go back five years. So the fourth industrial revolution, which is this idea that you know the technology revolution that we're going through now is a continuation of the first one that happened in the north of England in the 17th century and um, uh, to, to through um, through electronics and computing to to now and what's happening now is that um, technology you know we human humanity is becoming interwoven with technology in a way that is historically significant so it's an idea and it's an idea that Klaus Schwab the chairman of the World Economic Forum came up with to um, to explain the world around us and that's what leaders and storytellers are always in the process as we've already talked about here today mm. that you're always in a process of explaining the world around you and you do that either through stories or narratives the fourth industrial revolution if you go back to you know go to google trends you can see that it didn't exist then davos happened and it's now part of the global vernacular and we did that through telling stories about what the fourth industrial revolution actually means you can't just repeat the words because nobody understands it what you can say what you what you have to do is you have to say you know ai is going to help us do our jobs uh, and here's an example of how that's happening or robotics are going in the home mm. and this is henry and he's you know he's uh, this robot helps people you know this robot keeps old people company well i guess i mean the internet of things or the singularity i mean these are all concepts that are yeah you, know, you can say the words but yeah. you know the internet of things how do you explain what it is it's like well did you, you know now you can now now your fridge can tell you what to shop for at the supermarket mm. or your fridge can order your weekly shopping and or my smart watch telling me that you know yeah. my heart beats per minute drop below 40 that's right. last this is, night you know this is how my watch saved my life mm. you know that's that that's a story and so uh, by telling these stories in compelling ways, we uh, levered the idea of the fourth industrial revolution into the global mm. vernacular. And now it's a thing. People understand it. It's a meme. It's Richard, a, Richard, it's, Richard Dawkins would be proud. It's, yes. it's, it's a meme, right? Yeah. But it's a, why is it a meme? It's a meme because it helps people understand the world around them. Mm. And if you're the CEO of a company and you want people to stop turning left, you need them to turn right, you need to tell them a story about why right is better than left. Mm. Um, you know, uh, if you want people to paint the room pink instead of blue, you've got to say, do you know what? Pink is much better for the future because X, Y, Z. And if you go pink, you'll be part of the p team pink. Let's go mm. pink. Mm. You can't tell people, or you can tell people, but you also need to show them. And content, as as the kind of content that we've put, been talking about, is showing people and transmitting those stories and those memes into people's heads. <laughs> But there's something fundamentally human about this too in terms of whenever you sell a, a new concept or you're diffusing an innovation or a new idea, it's oftentimes easier to do it with a reference to, to history. I mean, I, I think of a, of a great gentleman who's got a podcast called The Second Renaissance. Oh, amazing. You know, like, you know, just rhymes, you know. <laughs> history doesn't repeat itself. When, whenever but, you know. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night, helps me get right yeah, back to sleep. Yeah, thank you. But whether it's, you know, whether it's The Second Renaissance, which builds and, in, you know, has this concept of a little cap nod to The First Renaissance and how, you know, pandemics have a history of unleashing creativity or web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, or the fourth industrial revolution, you're actually, in a sense, making sense of, your sense-making of a particular moment in time with a bit of a cap nod to, to history, and people can kind of go, yep, okay, I can understand the machinery and the physical machinery and the spinning jennies and whatever else and, you know, the Luddites and all of those things, and you go, that's what's happening with yeah. machine learning or artificial intelligence. It's just that it's a bit more software-y now. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, you know, history, history history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Mm. And so, you know, we're always looking for patterns. You know, humans are pathfinders, aren't they? We, we're always looking for which way to go, and we use the, the rearview mirror to guide our future actions. So, I mean, mm. you're a futurist. You, mm. you know this stuff. But, like, so there's this sense in today's world with a social dilemma and, you know, digital addiction and digital distraction from, you know, distraction from distraction and, and reconnecting with the analog world and, um, you know, privacy and, you know, our iPhones telling us, hey, maybe you should disconnect because you've been consuming more content than, than, you know, last week. I mean, how do you provide as an organization, as a brand, 
how do you provide digital nutrition that's meaningful, that's helpful for, for humans that you know might lead to their education or, or self-actualization, whatever it happens to be, um, when at the same time we're living in this world of clickbait and instant gratification and you know TikTok memes and all the rest? How do you how do you find that balance between sort of sustainable content? Um, I don't know if there's such a thing as evergreen, but how do you, as a brand, find that balance between, you know, if it bleeds, it leads and it's fresh and it's got to be new versus like what are some really great, deep and meaningful paradigm shifting pieces of content or concepts that's going to win hearts and minds? So it's always helpful if what you're going to talk about is actually true. Right, so what's the difference between a piece of greenwashing content and a piece of content that's actually telling a story? It's this is true. You know, we are making you know we're making sincere efforts to improve the state of the world. So one of my favourite customers is a company called Holsim. They are uh, the world's largest uh, building solutions company. Uh, a large proportion of their business is is concrete and cement and concrete and cement are um, a hugely carbon intensive materials and they're also all around us everywhere so 30 or I think 40 we might have polished the floor here there which you, uh, you know and is wherever you go concrete, yeah. it's very it's very nice floor yeah thank you had we had this conversation earlier you might have poured this floor with a lower carbon version of concrete provided by Holsim because Holsim understands that unless you solve for concrete, you cannot solve for climate change. So 30-40% of global carbon emissions are created by the the construction industry, some of it in new build and some of it as buildings grow older and leak energy and all that kind of stuff. They uh, So Holsim as a company has historically made all of its profits, made, um, you know, vast majority of its profits from shipping bags of carbon intensive material out the door it's not a sustainable future for a corporation and they are you know the company understands that very deeply and is making huge efforts to you know uh, invent new uh, lower carbon forms of construction materials invest in uh, more sustainable building materials and ways to build the world that are more sustainable than the mm. ones that we have used mm. in the past and as this is a this is a a, a tanker of a company like it you can't turn it around overnight you can't stop shipping bags of concrete out the door because that's what your shareholders have in have um, have invested in and you can over time change the way uh, change what it does and how it does it and so this goes back to the idea of it's really helpful if what you're doing is actually true because then you can you know Holsim can tell stories of how it is changing for a more sustainable mm -hmm. future in a very compelling way because they are actually doing it so that's helpful and so they're telling the stories of the the progress and and the innovations etc that they are rolling out yeah so they're telling the they're telling stories about how they've changed the light you know they've looked into the science of carbon emissions and brought down um, brought down uh, the carbon intensity of their core products they've come up with you know zero carbon I think a clinker which is the stuff that makes concrete they've done a whole bunch of really mm. interesting and important work around creating sustainable mm. construction techniques the point is that there are in doing that they have surfaced all of these great stories that are happening inside the company um, not just creating sustainable products but also how they treat their workforce and how they've encouraged uh, equity and all the all, you know all the kind of stuff mm. that you talk about on this second renaissance program it is very helpful if it's true if you want to tell stories about it mm. so that was that's kind of the first point mm. around you because you asked you know how do you tell compelling longevity mm. stories first of all do the work and then you've got stories to tell yeah second thing is if you've got those stories to tell tell them in a way that is compelling for the audience and you were talking about you know longevity around stories i don't believe it we live in an age when you know you you step on the bus you look at your phone for three minutes you might look at a social video for you know facebook counts a view at three seconds if you've mm. watched three seconds of a video you get a view 
Mm. And so in this kind of bubblegum world... We've got to feed the beast. In in this bubblegum world, you absolutely have to feed the beast, but you have to feed it with true stories Mm. that are compelling and get people to to engage for three seconds or more. So so you... You keep saying true here, which is, you know, a contentious term in these days after (laughs) certain presidents and all all the rest. I mean, it's interesting that politicians don't necessarily uh, need to talk about things that are uh, true in the sense that they will often make promises about the future. So Mm -hmm. they are um, actually excused from some of the very strict, you know, marketing or advertising guidelines that might apply to a brand. So I just want to tune into this idea of, of, of... truth and and not post truth and truthiness and true facts and all the rest but when you say true as a brand do you mean that it needs to be sort of digitally verified to to ensure that you know someone like wholesome or or unilever or whoever's you know transitioning into a green future that that they are telling something that they can you know verify on the blockchain how do you sort of measure that and and how do you bring it across so that it's believable so. and, yeah. and true I guess the most important audience who needs to believe it is your people. If one of your employees goes onto social and sees a a story told about the company and knows it's bullshit, then then you're sowing the seeds of trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're claiming, you know, net zero – and you and you're not net zero, then just like if you're if you're a lying politician, it might not come back to you come back to bite you right now, but mm. it probably will eventually. We're still waiting to see. If they, yeah. <laughs> they will. So the the most important audience are your people, and when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about sustainability and about uh, creating a better future, I think the most important thing is that that you are making sincere efforts. And I think you had uh, uh, Nikki Spar shot on on the second re- Renaissance runs Unilever in Australia and New Zealand, making sincere efforts. Right? Nobody would claim that a massive global corporation shipping washing powder by the ton load is going to be a hundred percent sustainable. And is it going to be more sustainable tomorrow than it is today because of Nikki's efforts? Yes, probably. And those efforts are sincere. And what we say to ourselves and our customers and our people is that we work with organisations who are committed to achieving the sustainable development goals. Mm. And the, there are 17 sustainable development goals. There, they, you know, as you know, they go from water to education to poverty to. So it doesn't take a lot to be committed to achieving the sustainable development goals. It just means you're trying to do, you know, you're trying to make tomorrow's world better than today's world. And the way the world's going, it's not hard to actually try to do those things. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about truth. Mm. And. I guess it's right, the country, the brand of Norway comes up in my mind um, as the, you know, as the Saudi Arabia of, of Scandinavia. Um, you know, Norway is, has this climate change paradox alive in the narrative around the country, right? So us Swedes are always a little bit jealous of the fact that uh, Norwegians always seem um, more or richer than, than, than Swedes. Um, and, you know, we've, we've sort of glanced across the border uh, with jealousy and a little bit of, you know, neighbourly contempt, um, <laughs> keeping up with, a, with the Norwegian Joneses. Is. Like the Victorians uh, and the New South Welshmen. There you go. So we look at the fact that 16% uh, of the automotive market is currently owned by Tesla, Sixty-five percent of vehicles in in Norway sold last year were electric, and ninety-seven percent of all electricity generated in the country mm-hmm. comes from renewables. And they are the second greenest economy in the world. We have these brand associations to Norway around fjords and the outdoors, and amazing outdoor brands like Napapiri and Heli Hansen, etc., embracing you know renewables and wind and you know the cold and the freshness of norway and then we go what funds all of that of course is oil and gas and the sovereign wealth fund if that was a corporation you'd be going okay well you know you're doing these bits over here that are really impressive in terms of the green transition 
But do you think it's right that you are financing all of this with revenues from uh, fossil fuels, fossil fuels that are being exported to other countries? And so the problem is sort of shifted while Norway has no problem saying 97% of all our electricity <laughs> comes from, from hydro and from wind, etc. So while it's easy to judge and all the rest, I also kind of go, hey, the important thing about Norway, and I think what brands can do that are not nation states necessarily is that it's not necessary to be perfect today but you do need to get started and you need to be able to showcase that you're making a transition and that those transitions are genuine and authentic yeah um, so i um, mean the counterfactual to norway is that they don't electrify and they just exploit the north sea oil and thanks very much i'll build my castle there would be quite a lot of political pressure to, you know, why are we doing this? Is it cheaper? Is it better? We're doing this because we know that the world is changing because of carbon emissions. We are pretty convinced that in 30 or 40 years, if the world is not has not undertaken an energy trans, transition, then, you know, things are going to be worse than if it has. So using the old, to, using the old tools to make the new... What's the, you know, what's the alternative? Mm. Turn the tap off? Yes, you probably should. Since that's not actually, you know, pragmatic, mm. then, if, you know, I applaud the Norwegians for um, maybe not filling the streets with Teslas, but, you know, electrifying the economy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is an interesting one because I, I, I think, um, it, you know, BP was on this sort of journey, right, a few years ago when... Beyond all, Petroleum. Yeah, Beyond Petroleum. People are like, ah, oh, that's just like greenwashing because all your revenues are still <laughs> yeah, from yeah, this yeah. space. It's not Beyond Petroleum yet. Um, and I'm just wondering whether as a consumer, as a, as a human being, we sometimes judge, you know, listed organisations, listed companies a bit harsher than, you know, a nation state and a brand such as Norway. And yeah. um, I'm curious to see what sort of objections you come up against when you're talking to leaders and, you know, CMOs and brand owners and, and you know, communication teams. And they're kind of going, oh, you know, we have a bit of dirty laundry over here. Can we really talk about some of the good stuff we talk about? Or is the, is the market going to say, hey, that's not true because you're not perfect yet? Yeah, well, if you're the CEO of one of these organizations, you are operating in um, a legal and economic environment that requires you to do certain things. So you can't, you know, if you're the CEO of BP, you cannot legally turn off the wells because your fiduciary duty is to the shareholders of BP and that's, you legally have to keep making profits and the only way you can make as many profits this year as you did last or more is to keep doing what you've been doing. But maybe you can look 10 years or 15 years in the future and start creating, you know, um, uh, BP has the world's largest solar company is one of its subsidiaries uh, and one of our customers actually, LightSource BP. So they are investing in, you know, BP is investing in the energy transition. The other alternative is they just go dirty and you, you get your Exxon, you know, you've got your Exxons who are happy to just go dirty but mm. even they understand that you know it's very difficult to argue when the world is drying up uh, you know the, the, the europe is in drought uh, uh, uh meanwhile australia is drowning scientists have been predicting this forever it's now happening it's not like it's a big surprise uh so if you're a human being and you understand that in 20 or 30 years the world is going to be different because of what we're doing today then it is incumbent upon you to kind of figure out how figure out how to change that and if you're the ceo of bp or one of these large corporations that is a contributor to the problem it's incumbent upon you to see within the constraints within which you operate within the financial and uh, innovation innovative uh, capabilities of the corporation how can you start to shift things mm. and i think it's i think it's okay and genuine to say these are the things that we are doing understand be better to keep the oil in the ground Understand that. And also, I'm the CEO of an oil company. And, you know, shifting some of the, as many resources as we can into the, into the transition. Mm. So it's a complicated narrative 
to tell if you are that CEO. And it's also a narrative that you have to engage your people on because at the end of the day, every day people are coming to work, making a decision whether they want to be there or not. And you need to to tell them a narrative that mm. gives them a reason to, un- to gives them a reason to do that. So then let's go back to concrete uh, to uh, excuse the pun to concretize these examples around content. To me, this scene sounds like a you know it's a sort of a commodity space. But I, please educate me if I'm wrong. How do you make stories that are sexy or that you know capture the imaginations of you know people in procurement or the end consumer when it comes to telling a, a sustainable story or the journey that wholesome is currently on yeah so okay in, in practical terms you can look at the wholesome's linkedin page and see all the stories that we're telling right okay. there so if you're a listener go and check that out if you're a viewer make sure you go to linkedin there and you check go. out go wholesome. to linkedin check out the wholesome linkedin page and you'll see all the stories that we're telling there it's an enormous organization and there's tons of stuff happening around the world and this is true of any of this is this will be true of any kind of many of your customers all of you mm. all of your all of your clients right there are stories going on all, all around the place so i need to dig deep into my memory to get to you know to some concrete some, examples. Some concrete, yeah, to get some <laughs> concrete examples. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to so, stop so with these well, puns. Things like, <laughs> so things like, you know, here's a 3D printed schoolhouse. Uh, here's a building built with uh, 25% less of the con- less concrete than uh, other technologies. Here's different ways that we've brought carbon emissions down from our products. Yeah, yeah. So what, what excites you at the moment? What's the, you know, what's your as the Okinawans would call it, their, you know, the ikigai, the, the mm. purpose, the overlap of purpose, passion, what you're clearly good at and what you can make some money from, but also what the world needs. Yes. Where, where does the content engine fit into all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we first, uh, when we first became friends all those years ago, I, ha- I was working fi- by my- I was working for myself by myself uh, as a writer and editor and a publisher and, uh, you know, did all sorts of projects, Business 21C was one of them. And I could never see the point of employing anybody else because I could never see how, you know, one plus one equal more than two. Uh, and then I got recruited into the World Economic Forum and all of a sudden I was running a team of, you know, 12, 15 people. And I did that for close to a decade, just building, you know, understanding how organisations go through cycles, how to run a team where everybody's doing what they ought to be doing and complementing each other. Uh, And I learned how to talk to people in a responsible way and tell narratives to motivate people to kind of all turn left, not right. And so when I left the forum... uh, three or four years ago, I knew, I knew that I wanted to start a, start my own company and uh, that and started the content engine, knew it wanted to be in content, obviously, called it the content engine, uh, knew that what I had learned at the World Economic Forum about how to structure content production as a factory model but to do it with quality and in a timely way. So high quality content often. That's what we did at the forum and that's what we do at the content engine. And so I learned the craft of content while I was uh, while I was an individual contributor, as they say, you know, in back when I was Mike Handley editorial. And I learned the craft of uh, leadership at the forum, and now I'm uh, well. I learned the, uh, I learned the technology of content and the craft of leadership at the forum, and now I'm applying that to the content engine. Took a couple of years to kind of figure out what we do. I mean, I knew we did content. I started at when I left the forum. I started doing consulting, and the end point of the consulting was well, you need a lot of high quality content, and then the client would say, okay. 
In fact, you were one of them. I was like, you need to, you need a lot of high quality content. You were like, yes, I do. Who's going to do it? I was like, well, that's a good question. Uh, I did, I did just for transparency purposes here. I did uh, hire you as a as a consultant on a on a project that has led to us relaunching Decoding Tomorrow, the newsletter, which is still in play. So See, ho- hopefully, I get some ticks of approval value. when you when you read it. So, yeah, I think yeah. I'll just send you my commission <laughs> invoice on that one. No more invoices, Mike. <laughs> so we talked about leadership craft and the narrative and the, I'm not going to call it the sausage factory of content because that's not what it is, but it's high quality content and well, how, how you kind of systematize you it. You know, there's nothing wrong with a good quality sausage and mm. a good quality sausage is made in a good quality sausage factory, yeah. right? You know, what makes, ugh, I hate this example, but what makes a Tesla a Tesla? It's the quality of the factory that it's made in. Mm. And what makes the quality of the content that we produce is the quality of the team and the technology technology and the process that we use to to create it and all of that was stuff that I learned through so I've been in content for 30 years now and this is my ikigai mm. cool and given that content is chemistry wrapped in narrative mm. what kind of brain chemistry do you seek to trigger by collaborating and helping your clients create their content? What's like, what's the effect so, that and, you're seeking? Yeah, so actually in most organisations, the challenge is not do we have stories to tell, the challenge is how do we tell them in a, in a compelling way repeatedly, right? You can do it once. I always say content is like, it's like feeding the kids. You can't say I fed the kids last week. We can, but that's not going to help. To, you need to feed them again today and tomorrow and the day three times, by the way. And content is very much like that. It's not good enough that you did it well last week. It's not good enough that you did it well yesterday. You have to do it again today and tomorrow and the day after because otherwise the audience doesn't care about you. They don't care about you. They only care what you're serving them today. You know, many corporate communications teams are set up for project work you know we're working towards the annual report or you know to communicate what's happening around the annual report or there's you know our annual leadership drive or they're set up, set up around that kind of stuff and they're also set up around many of them are set up around the traditional media and the traditional media is good for making the ceo feel like they're being quoted in the ft or the economist but bad for actually getting your message across first of all it's hit and miss and second of all, it's not constantly in your face in the way that digital is. And if you're on LinkedIn every day telling your staff, telling your potential staff, telling the people who follow your brand the stories and you're doing it in a, in a compelling way consistently, then you're hitting it out of the park in a way that your bosses probably didn't anticipate. And like, because then of course the end consumer or the end you know, the stakeholders that need to know something about Wholesome or some of your other major brands. Mm. Is it that like end brand perception that you're sort of seeking to, to shift or to embed or is it being front of mind? Like is it a is it a branding sort of challenge at the end of the day or Yeah, it's a branding it's a branding challenge because how do people understand what your organization stands for unless you tell them? And and you can't just tell them. You have to engage the. You have to engage their uh, their uh, analog hearts and their digital minds mm. by uh, by effective, repeated, impactful storytelling. Mm. That's the magic. So creating some some signal in all of this TikTok noise. So this is creating the. You know, it's consistent. You know, you're telling consistent stories about what the company stands for. So another one of our uh, another one of my favourite customers is Adeco. They are a, a you know a, a, a huge European based uh, human resources company that mm. supplies um, supplies uh, people to other large corporations mm. to do work. And so for them, the story is all about what is the nature of work? How do we maintain meaning in this increasingly digitized world? What does it mean, you know, particularly now, what's the, you know, what, what, what's the future of work? How are people going to be working in the future? Are they going to, you know, they go back into the office or do they stay out of the office? What are the, th- what are the 
big stories happening in the world of work. And the beauty of what we do with all of our customers is not just tell the internal stories about we did this, we did that, we put more, you know, less carbon in the concrete. It's it's what's happening in the external environment that is going to affect not just the the, the organization and the brand but the, the brand's partners and stakeholders and the things that are really on everybody's mind what is our take on that and mm. how do we interpret what's happening in the news today so are there um are there particular i don't, I don't want to be you know channel agnostic or, or channel specific here but are there particular channels technologies you know media types social media networks etc that you're particularly bullish on are there some that you avoid uh, have you got a have you got a little future gazing lens here for us to, to look into yeah well the, the, right now the game is all LinkedIn because Facebook has blotted it Facebook was it was all action around Facebook when in uh, about mm, where are we now 2022 like Six seven years ago, Facebook was really driving traffic. It was really uh, it was it was the channel that you needed to dominate. They were the first onto video, live video, live streaming. Then it got all then it got all hectic for them. The platform uh, technology was very much designed for um, for in, you know for en- engagement, and the the drive for engagement really drove some of the distortions that we saw around the elections and the misinformation, that kind of stuff. Twitter is great if you want to talk to journalists and tell your stories to journalists and to people who actually, you know, spend their lives consuming content. Twitter is a great place to do that. Uh, LinkedIn is where professionals go to be seen as professional and so the discourse is a bit more healthy. The It's not an amazing platform, but it's also not, so terrible uh, and uh, that's where most of our customers are putting their efforts because it's also a great place to recruit people obviously it's a great place to get your brand values out it's a great place to tell your stories TikTok is super fun uh, and also it's a it's um, for brands it's a kind of a treacherous place to be storytelling because it moves so quickly and uh, you know what works today may or may not work tomorrow. It's um, it's quite mysterious in the way it operates, and mm. so it's less less of a less of a strategic play and more yeah. of a more bit of fun. And what about the? I'm I'm just you know asking for a friend, mm. um, but um, self serving questions, but also for our clients. You know, do you have a view on sort of the digital nutrition mix, like? podcasting, video, picture says a thousand words, text, white papers, trend reports, like what's your what's your take on where do you, you know, what kind of mix do organizations in, in you know, either B2B or B2C? Yeah, so the um, way we solve this problem at the content engine is we have, uh, you know, I'm, I mentioned earlier that you need to, you need to tool up for consistency. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So you need to understand what content templates are at your fingertips and you need to be able to dynamically choose between those things. We package up content products in a way that enables our customers to choose between, you know, this story will be told well in a blog post, this story will be told well in a one minute social video. Let's pop this into the let's pop this into the pile for the newsletter and mix and match in a way that actually instead of going for the content mix first, you start with a story and then figure out how you're going to tell it. You might tell it in a couple of different ways. So you might put it in the newsletter, but then you might also make a social video and then link from the newsletter to the social mm. video and do a nice little you know, dance like that. Mm. But the point is that start with the menu and then figure out what the audience is hungry for and then order from the menu like that. Mm. Any particular sort of success stories that you guys have worked on or who, who do you kind of look to for for inspiration of a, of a brand that's totally nailed the mix or are really able to, to on a consistent basis, capture hearts and minds? Well, uh, you know, my experience at the, f- you know, if you look at the World Economic Forum's channels and the way that team uh, tells stories because, uh, that you know, that, that that's my heritage. So I love to look at all that and they get it right 
you know, they get it right around forum stories all the time. Mm. Uh, we have taken that, we've taken those lessons and, you know, from Wholesome at Deco, we've worked with uh, some of the biggest brands on the planet and we work with a bunch of UN agencies and multi multilateral organisations and there isn't a single organisation on the planet that couldn't that can't tell stories in that way. It's just a matter of understanding what makes a good social video and the answer is the first frame. If you get the first frame right, you know, you know, you get the first frame right and you understand how to tell the story from there, good to go. So mm. it's understanding what the audience is going to be interested in and then telling it in the way they want to hear it. Mm. Yeah. So you've you just shared with me a, a moment ago as well that you've you've grown the team from 10 to 30 just in the last six months at the at the content engine you've done it uh while working remotely for part of that time out of bondi although you, you should technically be in, in in geneva there's no shoulds but you know, <laughs> no, so no, that, that's no, where the key should. and the apartment uh, yeah. is i know i know you also live in, in in bondi but um i'm curious i mean it's always said that plumber's taps always leak um is that true in your in your instance or how have you been able to get the signal about the content engine out to the world to all of a sudden yeah. throw well, a fuel on fire. Okay, so I can't say I'm massively chuffed with where we are as a company tell about telling our, our story on our, on our channels. We're working on it all the time and also customers always get priority so mm. um, so But is that a case of like equipping your clients and and you know seeing the power of word of mouth that old school uh, idea? So the demand so uh, the demand for our product is infinite, right? There isn't an organization on the planet that doesn't need high quality content often. It just isn't. Mm. And if you think you don't, you're wrong because uh, this is how organizations communicate today. What was the constraining factor was how do you how do you you know how do you scale quality? So it took it, it took a, it took eighteen months two years of working in a startup environment where we tried all sorts of things. We tried, you know, we tried massive content-based project work. We tried, um, we did a, you know, we did a, we, we tried consulting around misinformation. We did a whole bunch of stuff. And then in the middle of last year, we are like, okay, we know what we want to do. We want to do high quality content often, and we want to do it in a way that is repeatable and is good value. We, we took the summer pretty much last year, the, Euro, the, the, the European summer, to put in place the foundation for, uh, for growth. So understanding what the roles are in the organization um, so that you can, you know, when you, need a, when you need an editorial account manager, you can advertise for the right person, you can recruit the right person, and when they join, you can teach them what to do without having to invent it again. So, you know, creating the roles, creating the, you know, productizing the, the product, so when you uh, before you know at the beginning of last year, if we were engaging with a potential new customer, I would meet with them and we'd have a good conversation. What problem were we trying to solve? Uh, I'd write a lovely proposal over three pages, and I'd you know suck my teeth as I put the price on the bottom of it, and I'd press send, and then I'd hope that it would all come in. And uh, and I was exhausted by all of that, and also understood that it wasn't going to scale. So. We said, you know, we're going to do this. We've got to do it to scale. We've got to create the foundations to scale. We productized what we do. We created the roles for growth. We uh, structured the marketing so that somebody who wasn't me could sell the product. We got a we got a fantastic head of growth, Rob, who is no doubt listening to this. You're amazing. Keep doing great work. And from there, it was just a matter of putting the blocks on top of each other mm. so it's not that it's not that um you know demand is not the constraint the constraint is being able to supply high quality content often for the customers that you've got because mm. i you know we could sell ton of we could sell a ton of it but then you can't deliver unless you've got the right talent the right technique you know at the same time in the in the last 12 months we've built from the ground up 
our own technology platform that um, structures the entire content supply chain from ideation through to distribution and analytics all in kind of one place so that our customers know where they're what's happening across all of their content um, all of their content products and can look at it go for approvals uh, approve stuff uh, check analytics all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. we build that from the ground up and uh, we can now you know we we've, we've built a platform that can now take hundreds of customers if we can you know backfill mm. the roles and the talent behind them and they can all quality check the so quality sausage check. manufacturing they can all go in and, and the sizzle sample yeah. the sample the sausages yeah. and whatever stage of production yeah yeah, yeah. change the ingredients change yeah. the ingredients yeah. fix the recipes and and all the yeah. rest yeah yeah so it's it's been it's been a super exciting year and you know there's you know more to come so. just reflecting on, on on our journey over the last hour here and 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 the narrative or the odyssey um i do think about the amount of organizational and brand narratives and stories that are going to need to change and evolve over the next eight years out to 2030 as there is a massive transition towards a green economy and so again an infinite amount of demand for telling new stories not about the past and old revenues but also where these companies are going to need to in a sense create trust with their consumers their customers their stakeholders their investors and talent to go yes this is what we used to stand for but now we've shifted you know beyond petroleum or whatever it happens to whatever be it happens to or be. norway yeah. into into the green well, you know, future from, and this from, is how we're doing from it. brown washing powder to green washing powder or whatever yeah. it is yeah. and how are you going how are you going to communicate that hmm. not going to do it by press release you're not going to do it by ceo speech you're going to have to do it on social and digital because that's where people are that's where people are watching yeah. So that's why there is an infinite demand for what we do mm. because it's not easy to get it right over and over and over again. You know, it's just not an easy thing to do. Mm. Well, Mike Hanley, thank you for helping us co-create content Amazing. Uh, so to, to feed the beast sustainably. Great to have you. It was worth the drive. Yeah. Thank you for out being of, on out the... Out of the eastern suburbs. Yeah. Thank you for being on the second renaissance and making it as mimetic as the fourth industrial revolution. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Can't wait to do it again. Should we do it next week? <laughs> we will. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you want to learn more about Mike Handley and the Content Engine, I'm sure they can Google. www.thecontentengine.com and even if you, if you don't spell it correctly, uh, Google will tell you with its algorithms. What yeah, you might look have me up for. on LinkedIn. I publish a weekly newsletter, and um, one of the reasons why I wanted to come and do this podcast was because whenever it comes out, I won't have to write the newsletter that week. I'll just plonk it in. Yeah, so it's perfect. called Content Ed, and it's published on LinkedIn, and you sub can subscribe for free with just one click. Yeah, easy. We love that. Totally seamless. Totally. Thanks, seamless. Mike. For more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.